You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Opal Whiteley was born around the turn of the 20th century. She was the daughter of an Oregon logger and lived in the U.S. her entire childhood. However, as she reached adulthood, a diary was printed that brought this seemingly indisputable fact into question. Opal wrote this diary when she was six or seven years old. In it, she makes astonishing claims about her lineage. Despite being born and living in Oregon her entire life, she asserts that she is the daughter of Henri d'Orléans, heir to the Bourbon claim of the Crown of France. She writes about her angel mother and father who were of royal blood. An entire fantastical story is laid out in which this would-be princess lives disinherited from her rightful position. The story could easily have been dismissed as childish ramblings were it not for a strange occurrence 13 years later. In 1933, newspapers reported of an American woman living in the household of the Maharaja of Udaipur, India, as a royal guest. To the astonishment of the reporter who had seen her, it was Opal Whiteley. It appears she had convinced the Maharaja of the legitimacy of her royal claim. He reacted as if she was a fellow royal and allowed her to stay at the palace. Opal was an American girl born the daughter of a logger. How had she managed to dupe a Maharaja into believing her claims? For Claude Bristol, it's an example of the extraordinary power of belief. If you can convince yourself of something, whether there is any truth in what you believe or not, the world will respond as if it is so. Opal Whiteley believed in her story to such a degree that her mannerisms, speech, and demeanor became that of a royal. Other people, unaware of her true heritage and not sensing anything out of place in her actions, took her at face value and accepted her as such. Bristol spent many years researching similar phenomena. He began as a newspaper reporter, then moved into investment banking and business. While stationed in France with the US military at the end of World War I, he was frustrated by the experience of not having enough money for minor luxuries like cigarettes and chewing gum. He made a vow that upon returning to America, he was going to be wealthy. This thought consumed his mind to such an extent that he often caught himself doodling dollar signs on notepads and on the covers of telephone directories. Such actions slowly created a sense of destiny. Once back in the US, it wasn't long before he became vice president of a well-known Pacific Coast bank. Here is actress and comedian Phyllis Diller describing the impact the book has made on her career. Oh, I, re I really mean that. Look at me. <laughs> I have everything that I want out of life. And if I hadn't read that book, I don't know what I would be doing now. Bristol published The Magic of Believing in 1948, and in later years, he became a popular speaker. The four themes we'll look at from the book are, first, the power of thought and belief. Bristol cites numerous experiments and examples. Second, using the power of belief for yourself. We'll cover some of the techniques Bristol suggests for impressing an idea on your subconscious. Third, the factors that sabotage the power of believing, chief among them being skepticism. Finally, we'll explore how creating a sense of destiny about yourself, whether true or not, could be the factor that propels you to greatness. In the 1930s, Dr. J.B. Ryan of Duke University conducted a famous series of experiments that, he felt, proved the existence of the soul and the power of thought. The first involved dice, a mechanical device through dice, while people in the room attempted to influence the outcome of each throw through thought alone. So as not to physically interfere with the results, they weren't allowed near the machine, but were instead encouraged to think of a number. Over the course of millions of throws, it appeared that, through thought alone, the subjects could influence the machine to throw the number they were thinking of. The sheer number of throws ruled out randomness. Dr. Ryan also worked alongside the British psychologist William McDougall to conduct experiments with people who claimed to have clairvoyant and telepathic abilities. The telepaths were asked to identify cards being drawn from a pack while being in different rooms and buildings. If they were successful, meaning their scores were above those in line with statistical probability, it would prove that their extrasensory perception, or ESP, 
operated beyond the physical limits of space. The second series of experiments involved the clairvoyants. They were tasked with guessing a sequence of cards before they had been shuffled. For one group, they had to make this guess two days before the event. Astonishingly, they were generally successful. ESP seemed to operate outside the realm of time as well as space. Other labs at the time were able to replicate the results. The combined results led Dr. Ryan to conclude that the mind does indeed possess properties not belonging to physics as we know it. Bristol references many other examples to build his case that thought transcends space and time. Zoom forward to today, and although advances in quantum physics are starting to make scientists consider the possibility that consciousness affects physical reality, the scientific status quo is still dominated by materialism. There is skepticism when it comes to talk of God, infinite intelligence, or any other power besides the laws of nature. Such skepticism seeps into popular consciousness and makes us hesitant to listen to the voices that promote different theories. The potential for you to be skeptical and overlook the opportunity to use the power of belief is why Bristol dedicates so many pages to various experiments and occurrences. Hopefully, you will approach the book with an open mind. After all, there's nothing stopping you from experimenting with Bristol's techniques and drawing your own conclusions. His point about the power of belief is that, well, you have to believe in it. For results to happen, you have to expect to see them. A recurring theme with the experiments Bristol cites is that the participants were both willing to believe and enthusiastic about the research. The more people believed in the power of the mind, the more it was seen to work irrespective of the laws of nature. Or as the philosopher William James put it, belief creates its verification in fact. Bristol refers to the results revealed by the experiments and occurrences as mind stuff. This vague term reflects the fact that he can't explain exactly what this realm beyond the physical is or where it resides. He just knows that its power is real. When we return, we'll continue our look into the magic of believing. We'll cover some of the techniques Bristol suggests for impressing an idea on your subconscious. Then we'll look at how skepticism works against you. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our look into the 1948 classic, The Magic of Believing. It's written by Claude M. Bristol. We'll explore how to apply the power of belief. Then we'll look at the factors that sabotage the power of believing, chief among them being skepticism. Bristol offers two main techniques for trying out the power of belief. The first requires three or four business or similar sized cards. On them, write or draw a word picture of your deepest desire. This might be a million dollars, the love of your life, perfect health, or your dream job. It doesn't matter what you choose so long as you are clear about your desire. Once you've created this word picture, replicate it on the other three cards and then put them in prominent places. Bristol suggests your handbag or wallet, on your bedside table, stuck to your shaving mirror or dressing table, or at your desk. The point is that you encounter them throughout the course of your day. Frequent viewing causes your desire to sink into your subconscious mind. The actor Jim Carrey had great success with a similar technique. Instead of writing his desire down on a business card, he simply wrote himself a check for $10 million, the amount he'd like to be paid for a film. While struggling to make a name for himself in the early days of his Hollywood career, he would park his car on Mulholland Drive, look out over the city, and dream of one day cashing this check. Here is Carrey explaining what happened on The Oprah Winfrey Show. I wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself five years, and I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated. And just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on Dumb and Dumber. Bristol's second technique involves the use of a mirror. Find one large enough to see the upper half of your body and head. Assume a strong and upright posture. Then look into your eyes and tell yourself that you are going to get what you want. Obviously, prior to using this technique, you must be clear about your desire. 
However, once you are certain about what this is, repeat confidently that it is yours while staring at your reflection. Bristol advises getting in the habit of practicing this technique twice a day, once upon waking in the morning and again before retiring at night. The subconscious is at its most impressionable during these times. With your conscious mind subdued, you're less likely to be critical about the chances of achieving your desires. Bristol cites a few examples of famous figures using this technique. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill would never make a speech in public without first having performed it privately in front of his mirror. The evangelical preacher Billy Sunday was also fond of performing to his reflection. On seeing him, a reporter recalled that he bounded about the hotel room, now peering intently out of the window with one foot on the sill, now grasping the dressing table firmly in both hands while lecturing his reflection in the mirror. If this sounds overly dramatic, that's the point. You must evoke the same spirit and commitment to make these techniques work. First, the vibration of your thought must be powerful. According to the National Science Forum, we have between 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Most of these won't sink into your subconscious mind and form beliefs. The ones that do are backed by intensity. Think of your desire regularly and with passion. Get worked up about what you want to achieve. This is the only way for an innocuous thought to become an unshakable belief. In the process of doing this, you'll become obsessed with your goals. While society warns you against reaching such a level, Bristol feels it is essential. Whether your aim is wealth or fame or position or knowledge, he says, you can have it, provided you are willing to make the objective the burning desire of your life. Such a statement might scare you. Are you prepared to give this amount of commitment? Society typically labels people who do this as weird or unhealthy, warning them that they could be jeopardizing some other aspect of their life. So be clear as to what lengths you're willing to go. If it's to the end of the earth, you'll get what you want if only because such determination is so rare. Alongside statistics on the number of thoughts we think each day, the National Science Forum also reveals the nature of these thoughts. The news isn't good. Roughly 85% are negative. How can the techniques in The Magic of Believing work against such a mental backdrop? The simple answer is that they can't. Thoughts backed by emotion sink into your subconscious mind. This is the case whether they are negative or positive, true or false. If you regularly think about an outcome and do so with strong emotion, you'll be creating those conditions and experiences in your life. Remember that if 80% of your thoughts are negative, the positive images and affirmations that you're making won't be able to override them. How can you combat this seemingly human disposition to be negative? Through awareness and discipline. You can't do these techniques and then relax your mental vigilance for the rest of the day. With any spare moment you have, Bristol says, turn your attention to the contemplation of your desire. Of course, when you're actively engaged in your work, conversing with friends or engrossed in a hobby, this won't be possible. However, for other less attention-absorbing tasks like walking, washing, commuting, you can switch your thoughts back to your desires. In addition to this daily practice, be aware of when you're thinking negatively. These thoughts may occur spontaneously, but if you remain vigilant, you'll then have the ability to redirect them towards your goals. A predisposition towards negative thinking is not the only obstacle you'll encounter in implementing the techniques from the magic of believing. Skepticism will also render them useless. Bristol's book, alongside titles such as The Power of Your Subconscious Mind and Think and Grow Rich, were the forefathers of the law of attraction genre. Although they never explicitly use this term, they talk about the same phenomenon that was the focus of later bestsellers like The Secret and Ask and It Is Given. The principle is this. The vibration you put out to the world will be returned back to you in the form of the circumstances and events of your life. While many declare that the law of attraction has changed their life, the concept is not without detractors. The main criticism is that it is not a law. There is nothing scientifically proven about its claims. Therefore, in a world where science shapes our understanding of reality, it can be all too easy to approach books like The Magic of Believing with a closed mind. To do so would be a mistake. Not only are you denying yourself the opportunity to harness the forces of your mind, but you're also setting yourself up to fail. Throughout the book, Bristol provides evidence of how skepticism nullifies the power of belief. For example, Dr. Ryan's dice-throwing experiments produced results lower than those accredited to chance when the subjects were distracted or negative suggestions were made about the guesser's abilities to predict the numbers. 
A lack of enthusiasm on the subject's behalf, typically caused by spending too long at the task, would also negatively impact the results. John O'Neill, a science editor of the New York Herald at the time, was privy to the DICE experiments undertaken at Duke University. O'Neill reported how a young woman was able to distract one of the male subjects by scoffing at his professed ability to demonstrate his power of the mind to direct matter. The result was that it weakened his belief in his own psychic abilities and his results fell back to the mean. So put your skepticism to the side and give Bristol's theory a chance Make sure that when you try them, do it wholeheartedly and with the expectation of seeing results. After all, science is continually throwing up new findings and research on the power of thought and the mind. Scientists may have only begun to scratch the surface when understanding the laws that govern the universe. Let's take one final break. When we return, we'll conclude our look into Bristol's The Magic of Believing. We'll explore how creating a sense of destiny about yourself, whether true or not, could be the factor that propels you to greatness. Then we'll end by reflecting on the book's legacy. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our look into the magic of believing. It's written by Claude M. Bristol. We'll look at how to create a sense of destiny and how it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. Then we'll end by reflecting on the book's impact and some criticisms. Aside from being two of the greatest military leaders history has known, what do Napoleon and Alexander the Great have in common? You might answer belief in themselves, a mastery of military tactics, and an ability to inspire men. However, you might not be aware that they both experienced highly suggestive prophecies regarding their respective destinies before they achieved their fame and power. Legend has it that Alexander cut the Gordian knot when presented with the problem of how to untie this massed tangle of rope. The prophecy, according to an oracle at the time, was that the man to do so would then go on to conquer Asia. Once Alexander had defeated his father's enemy, Darius of Syria, this is exactly what he did. Napoleon was given a star sapphire by a gypsy when he was a child. While giving him this jewel, she also told him that it would bring him luck and, one day, he would become emperor of France. Despite his Corsican birth, Napoleon went on to fulfill this destiny by the age of 35. Such occurrences wouldn't be out of place in a children's storybook. Is it plausible they had an impact on these two titans of history? Certainly the sapphire was not charmed and the act of cutting a knot can't create luck. But when two egotistical individuals are told they will go on to create history, it won't take much for a highly suggestive mystical prophecy to affect them. They were now men of destiny, and the incidents with the jewel and knot simply watered the seeds of belief that already existed. A more recent example is Winston Churchill. Churchill's ancestor was the Duke of Marlborough who had stood up to Franco-Bavarian forces and secured an unlikely victory against them at the Battle of Blenheim. Growing up, Churchill knew all the stories of the Duke's triumph, which instilled in him a sense that he was the scion of a family of military genius. When in later life Britain had to stand up to another dominating European power, Nazi Germany, Churchill felt himself to be the man of the hour, destined to take the leading role. You may be wondering, how can you foster your own sense of destiny? While it's unlikely you can dupe yourself with a staged ceremony or historic artifact, you can start feeding your mind with the idea that you're in line for greatness. It doesn't matter if you have little idea how this will come about. So, allow yourself to feel special. Although some might view it as conceited, this belief will put your challenges into perspective and help you find answers when faced with an apparent dead end. It will allow you to think on a scale much bigger than your peers. Bristol's exploration of the mystical doesn't end with Napoleon and Alexander. While working as a church editor for a large newspaper, he spent a great deal of time researching different religions. He became familiar with the prayers, ceremonies, and tactics preachers and religious leaders used to create a state of suggestibility in their audience. With their conscious critical mind silenced, people were ready to believe. As a result, miraculous healings sometimes followed. Bristol also investigated the worlds of white and black magic, 
He reports on warts disappearing if the host agreed to plant a healing artifact in their garden. Holy sites like Lourdes in France have thousands of documented cases of diseases, sometimes terminal, disappearing after a pilgrim visit. Voodoo rituals can produce similar results. These seemingly bizarre occurrences led Bristol to the conclusion there was a golden thread running throughout all religions and the occult. It wasn't the object that the person believed in, whether that was a cross or an incantation, but belief itself that brought about the change. How many seemingly insignificant superstitions do you allow to have sway over your mind? Do you stick to rigid routines, believing that by repeating certain acts in the same manner you will be blessed with luck? There's a good reason why we do this. At some level, we're very aware of the power of self-fulfilling prophecy. So start to place your belief in the power of belief itself. Know that it can heal you, provide you with answers, enable you to meet the love of your life, and bless you with success beyond your wildest dreams. Without the need for amulets, incantations, a preacher, or even a mentor you respect, know that if you can instill a relaxed certainty about a certain goal being reached, then the subconscious mind will go to work and make it happen. In this book insight, we've explored the various stages of embracing the power of belief. First came the evidence. It's clear from experiments and from your own observations that there is a power greater than the material. The physical world is molded by thoughts and wishes. With this understanding, we then moved on to the techniques you can use to harness this power. Business cards and a mirror are all you need, but for anything you use to be effective, it must be performed with emotional intensity. After having mastered these techniques, you'll need to be aware of what might sabotage your success. Skepticism is the force that renders the power of belief useless, so you should do all you can to ignore societal conditioning. Finally, you'll want to foster a sense of destiny about yourself. This will keep you moving towards your goal, regardless of any adversity you face. It would be easy to criticize the magic of believing. The book was written almost 75 years ago and its examples may seem dated. Today's self-help audiences are shifting towards books backed with recent scientific research on subjects like habits and willpower or powerful personal stories with applicable life lessons. Talk of the law of attraction, parapsychology and the power of belief can come across as passé. And of the many experiments that Bristol references, you won't find many of them referenced in today's scientific journals, let alone replicated. Take a deeper look at what Bristol is saying, though, and he might win you over. Bristol still makes a convincing case that there is a realm beyond the physical. We are not just physical beings isolated by our bodies and subject to forces beyond our control. Our minds are part of the larger consciousness of the universe, and we can use this connection to shape reality, to do great things. Moreover, recent research on the power of placebo only supports Bristol's contention that belief can have astonishing force. Bristol should also be praised for refusing to slip into hyperbole. In an era when similar books were promising the world and mentioning little of the work needed to achieve it, Bristol showed moderation. He instructs that you shouldn't ask for anything you don't believe yourself capable of achieving. The trick is to settle on something big that just might be possible. And he stresses the importance of taking action at every step of the way. You can't rely on the subconscious mind or the law of attraction to do everything. If you take these points into consideration and don't get frustrated if it's taking a long time to manifest your desires, you'll find his theory surprisingly accessible and powerful. The magic of believing stands the test of time. Soon after its release, the concert pianist Liberace was praising it to such a degree that he released a tribute song in 1955 carrying the name of the book. Here's a brief clip. All the good things in life are just waiting for you with the magic of believing. Comedian Phyllis Diller credited it with nothing less than her breakthrough into the world of show business. Prior to using the power of belief, her act was crippled by stage fright. After applying Bristol's techniques, she featured in over 40 films and inspired a generation of female comics like Joan Rivers, Roseanne Barr, and Ellen DeGeneres. Perhaps the book is deserving of the subtitle that goes with some editions, The Immortal Program to Unlocking the Success Power of Your Mind. The subject matter will never age. Audiences well into the future will benefit from the reminder that, although many sources claim to know the secret to success, there'll only ever be one golden thread. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.